In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we hear about the 40 days into Jesus' first day on the job. Just before these famous 40 days, just as Jesus was dipped into those muddy waters of the Jordan, he hears directly, with no uncertainty, that he is God's beloved son. But now, Jesus has to figure out, with a trial by fire, what that means. In other words, he has to contend with temptation. He has to know who he is, and if he is worthy, and to whom he is answering with his life. So to prepare himself for this test, Jesus, just like Moses before him, fasts for 40 days, 40 long days. And at the end of those 40 days, we hear this beautiful three-word tribute to Jesus' humanity. He was famished. Just ask anyone who has ever been on a diet. Don't expect any mere mortal to make great decisions about one's diet while sitting in front of a cute little pint of Ben and Jerry's mint chocolate chip ice cream. But fully human Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. What better time for Satan to move in? And so Satan tempts Jesus with the promise of bread, not just stale, white, wonder bread, but newly baked bread, just like we prepare every Sunday for our newcomers. And next, he shows him the glory and the power of all the world's leaders and Finally, the promise of rescue paired with the suggestion that God is not sufficient enough to keep Jesus safe. All Jesus has to do in return is worship Satan as his main employer. Bread, power, safety. But it just as well might have been youth, beauty, and wealth. Or how about confidence, fame, security? On one level, we experience specific temptations very concretely. But on the other hand, in another way, they're all the same. They all ask us to shift our alliance, our trust, our confidence away from a loving, personal, transcendent God and towards some lesser substitute that falsely promises a more secure and controllable destiny. So let's go there. Let's talk about the not too subtle struggle the whole world seems to be going through right now to figure out how to deal with the coronavirus. How do we do that? together. The temptation would be to dodge this discussion with a heavy dose of denial. To wait until it's, it, it hits with force until we decide how to get ready, how to prepare, how to respond as Christians. The temptation would be to slide into just a tad of mass hysteria or to search for the nearest scapegoat, or better yet, to take 20 trips to Costco in the next few days, to buy up all the peanut butter, wine, and toilet paper that can fit into our SUVs. All these might be niggling temptations at this point. And yet, here we are, here we are in the presence of God, together, hearing about Jesus being tempted when he was famished. And we have the chance to pause, 
to plan and to prepare. For some reason this week, I was reminded of those moments when you're in a plane and you're just about ready to take off, you're just about ready to fly with a bunch of strangers. And first thing you know, you get this superfluous direction on how to fasten your seat belt. Seriously? Is there anyone who doesn't yet know how to fasten a seat belt? But then it's interesting because parents, particularly those who are next to their young ones, they are instructed what they are supposed to do in case an oxygen mask comes down and drops in front of them. It seems that the first thing that they are supposed to do is to put on their own mask. And only then are they supposed to help their child put on his or hers. Now I'm telling you, if I was a young parent at this point and and my child was next to me, I would have to wrestle myself into that discipline. Everything in me would want to help my little one first. So here's the deal. And I want to say that I am just starting this conversation and that we together will be having a further conversation in the next weeks and months and our worship committee will definitely be part of this, uh, these suggestions that I'm about to offer. But I find myself pondering, what would it look like for us to put on our own oxygen mask first so that as the body of Christ, we are better equipped to help each other and the world in the days to come? So here are just three ideas as starters for our specific community. Uh, you all know about the hand washing. I'm not even going to go there, okay? You know that. So, but at the same time, we do need to become super vigilant about not coming to church if we feel the least bit sick. And here I'm including myself. Got the sniffles. Got a cold coming on. I was actually with a friend yesterday. I kid you not. I went up, I hugged my friend, and then we stood back and she says, no, no, I'm not hugging today. I have a bad cold. And I said, really? Suddenly, you find yourself with a low-grade fever, perhaps? Stay home. Stay home and pray with us and for us at your home, of course. But here's the important thing. Be sure to let one of us know what is going on so that we can pray with you and find out how we can help. Now here's the second idea, and this one is going to be tough for us. But I'm thinking in order to put on our own oxygen mask first when we worship together, we need to revisit how we exchange the kiss or the handshake or the hug of peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I love that particular moment in our worship time together. I, I just crave it. But here's the deal. Touching one another might prevent that flow of oxygen that we need to get through this crisis together. Who would have thought? So this is what I am thinking. Years ago, when I visited uh, in Aurangabad, India, there, as our president uh, showed us this week, people greet one another in a different way. They first, they look at each other's eyes, and then they fold their hands in the form of a prayer. And then with a little bow, not a huge bow, just a little bow. They say, namaste. And of course, namaste means, I greet the God in you. 
Now here's the invitation. When we come to the kiss of peace today and in the weeks and months to come, I invite you to face the person in front of you, to hold your hands like that, and with a slight bow, say whatever greeting comes to your mind. You can say namaste, but if that's not your thing, you can say, hey, how's it going? Or, good to see you. Or, glad you're here. Or, what's your name again? <laughs> Maybe even the peace of Christ be with you. Finally, the third suggestion of how to put on our oxygen mask on first. When the early Christians fasted during the 40 days of Lent, they did not do so thinking that God was more pleased if they were miserable. That has nothing to do with the God who loves us like a father. The only reason, and in fact the only good reason to fast, is so that we have more to give away to those who need it. Now in my view, this is the new challenge and the new reality that the coronavirus is here to teach us. It might just turn this outbreak into a blessing. The truth is, we can no longer pretend that any one country or any one people can be isolated from the rest of the world. You would have thought that climate change would have taught us that already, but here we are, still learning on that front. But finally, immediately, directly, this coronavirus is living proof. And I mean that, living proof. We are all connected. We are all God's children. And what happens to the people in China and Italy and the Congo matters to us. Helping ourselves first is a start. But we also have to carefully put on the oxygen mask on the rest of the world, particularly on the children and the elderly who are most at risk. And who are they? They are the ones who are already hungry, who are already stranded, who are already without medical care. So our presiding Bishop Curry has invited all of us to fast and he's suggesting that we would fast always, if you care to do so, on Wednesdays, so that we know we're fasting together. Why do we fast? Why do we put aside the Ben and Jerry's chocolate chip, mint, ice cream? We fast so that we have more money to gather and to send on those their behalf. Perhaps this Lent we can decide together what agency can best help put that oxygen mask on those that we wish to save. We too have to contend with temptation. Just like Jesus, we too have to know who we are and if we are worthy, and to whom we should answer with our lives. Amen. Amen.